Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today we're joined by the fantastic producers, creators, and showrunners from Netflix's The Woman in the House Across the Street from The Girl in the Window. We are joined today by showrunners and creators Rachel Ramrus, Hugh Davidson, and Larry Dorff, and executive producers from Gloria Sanchez Productions, Brittany Segal, and Jessica Elbaum. And um, I wanted to start by asking you all a bit about the initial kind of precipice of, of this series coming together, because Rachel, I believe it was from you reading a lot of these sorts of books within the genre and kind of starting to find the humor in the connective thread of all the details that tend to just pop up and all of the very similar plot points and was interested for all of you in how that was kind of the initial point of like finding the humor and finding the details that you wanted to include in a potential series to create this narrative thread and, and how that really set the tone for the show for you all. Wow, I wish I had always answered that question the way you had just asked it. You, it was perfect. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. I mean, I, um, I, along with everyone, read Gone Girl, and then I tend to just um, let my iPad, you know, it, if you like this book, you'll like this book. And then I just kept reading ones, um, you know, Girl on the Train and Woman in Cabin 10 and Woman in the Window. And there's, you know, they all involve this unreliable um, woman with a tragic past who witnesses a murder and people don't believe her. Um, and she drinks too much and takes too many pills. And then of course, in the end, she's, she's vindicated. Um, and they're, you know, just like these series that we all love to watch, they're bingey books and I would finish them and just, I couldn't put them down. And I think the key though to, to, to what we tried to do is um, I love those books. I mean, I really do. I, I, I think they're really fun. And so at no point were we trying to make fun of them about how stupid they are, um, but it was also finding like the joy in the, the chaos of these stories. Um, and so that's what we tried to do. And then what was kind of the initial connect that came together with kind of the three of you as creators and showrunners and with that relationship with Gloria Sanchez and, and how you all ended up collaborating on the series together? Well, I told these two bozos to read all the same books because I don't <laughs> think they would have read them otherwise. And they found it just as funny. And then I had a personal relationship uh, with Jessica and I immediately just thought if anybody was going to do this, it was going to be Gloria Sanchez. And and you know. well, what happened was we we when Rachel told Larry and I, I mean, she sat up in bed one night and said, "Oh my God, these these are crazy. We're married. We don't just we're not coworkers." That we're I wasn't in the bed that night. Um, but but she sat up and she was like, "This is." She was laughing and she was like, "Oh my God, it's the same thing again." So then Larry, she assigned the reading to her coworkers, me and Larry, and we read them. And they were so funny because really not in each one, but once you read five, it was like the, ver the cliches or the, the same signposts in each thing, whatever it was that was the same stuff. We knew we wanted to do something comedic with it. And then Rachel and Larry and I, we sat down and we wrote like this one voiceover that opens the show. And that was all we wrote. And then Rachel went and talked to Jessica and you, and you did it to Jessica, right? You read the- I mean, we just had some iced tea, right, Jess? And I, <laughs> I think I had a lemonade. I think you had iced tea. We went okay. to Jones on 3rd on Ventura. Yeah, that's where it all started. So we had no plot or anything. We did, I mean, obviously we knew it was gonna be a plot like these other ones, but we didn't know anything except we wrote this voiceover and that was the way kind of in. Yeah, and, and when Rachel, when we had our lemonades, um, I mean, any, any, I've known Rachel for so long and, we had worked together. Um, she came out to Mexico City. She was in Barb and Star. Um, and I've just always been such a fan. And she just warmed my heart and is so funny. And so when she emailed that she had an idea, I was like, of course, let's meet right away. She pitched it. I was like, yes, of course. And then Brittany Siegel, who was just starting at the company, came in. I was like, give me a minute. I need to share this with Brittany. And I think, Britt, it was the first thing you read when you came over to the company. Yes. I started on January like 6th or something like that. And you sent it to me before the holiday break. 
And it was like the old, you know, it was the first thing I read and I loved it. And by that time, Rach, I think you had written an outline, right? like a rough outline about whatever the pilot was. And it was just such a no brainer. And when I got in the new year to talk to Jess, I was like, we have to do this. Um, and yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> And I wanted to ask all of you about that, what the journey was in terms of finding the tone of the series, because kind of to the point earlier, it's not going into a full blown out parody and it's really finding kind of the subtle humor and the details that you can interlace. You know, sometimes it's, it's the thing of like a character complaining about giving a tip to a taxi driver is too much money and you look and it's $10. Um, you know, there's the voiceover elements which are read in a deadly serious tone, but what is being said is actually humorous when you kind of pause and read play it in your mind um, and so I was interested from all of you in in terms of how you really figured out tonally the way that you wanted to create this because it also sets up the first couple of episodes with like this real earnestness and seriousness and then kind of carries the absurdity further once you have the audience inside of the story and with these characters yeah we well our instinct the three of us me uh Rachel and Hugh we we all come from the groundlings so we all we've known each other and been writing together for like if we've known each other for 20 years and have been writing together for 15 of those years. And um, so our instinct was to make it, um, at first, it was gonna be much more comedic, um, much more silly. And I think rightly so, it was, I think Netflix and Gloria Sanchez that smartly wanted us to, let's get the audience hooked on the mystery and because if it's just a, a, a straight parody, it's going to get old pretty quickly. And you're not really, it's not going to be very bingy and you're not going to really care that much. And it's not going to have the staying power. Um, so we did slow it down. Uh, we worked with a great uh, writer, Marty Noxon, who did Sharp Objects. And she helped us uh, with sort of the mystery elements, you know, during the outline stage. Um, and it is sort of a slow burn. It's, it starts out where you might be like, is this a comedy? Is it a thriller? Um, but as you get invested into the mystery and the story, it's, it gets more and more absurd as the series goes along. And when it comes to the casting as well, you've cast it really beautifully with actors who can play to kind of both of those aspects of what the show is and really kind of found the line in their performances where it doesn't feel like anybody in the show is in a different show to the rest of the cast, which I think is also a testament as well. You know, and if you take Kristen Bell, you know, you've got kind of like drunk Veronica Mars where it's like, we understand that she's figuring out details and she's smart enough to put it together, but we also understand kind of like the absurdity and the comedy coming in as, as well with some of the situations and some of the scenarios. Um, and so what was the journey in, in terms of casting with such a specific eye to finding people like Kristen and the rest of the cast who could really kind of tread that line very carefully for you all? Bess and Britt, you, you brought Kristen to us, right? I mean, we had that one meeting. Yeah, we, we had been looking for something to do with Kristen because I had just come over from Netflix and I knew that Netflix wanted to do something with Kristen. And when Jessica and I spoke about, okay, who are the people we want to target? She was the very top. And it was one of those very rare things where we sent her the outline that I, I read of yours. And then two or three days later, her agent was like, yeah, she's in. So it was, it was kind of crazy and hard to believe. And then... Um, yeah, Kristen is such a smart actress. I mean, she's really a comedic genius and she really, as you said, towed the line perfectly. Um, and Michael Lehman, our director of all of the episodes definitely helped to uh, make sure that what Kristen was doing was what the other actors were doing as well. But I must say like all of the actors really got the joke. I mean, and you know, Tom Riley is just a total genius and his scenes with Kristen really, uh, really pop out as as tonal successes because he really understood it too. So I think it all sort of trickles down from from Kristen. When everyone saw what she was doing, it became really clear what the what the joke was and what that the right tonal line was to hit. And I'm really glad that, that Brittany brought up Michael Lehman, the, the director of the series there, because you know, this is a show that 
when you're watching it, if you look around the frame, there's kind of always extra details to look for. And also the camera movement itself and the way that the story's t told kind of is really leaning into the genre in terms of placement and blocking of scenes and the way that we're we're seeing things across the street, you know, the way that we see the scene when it looks like someone's been stabbed in the neck is filmed in a very specific way where we're in Anna's perspective at that point. Um, and so wanted to ask about, you know, kind of where Michael came into the picture and, and how you all worked collaboratively with him to figure out the visual way that you wanted to tell the story, because it feels like that's just as important as what was on the page in terms of the dialogue for the characters. Yeah, I think, I think um, since once we ha had it, that we wanted it to feel like a real thriller that be became absurd and not a comedy from the get-go. The look of it needed to be the same as if it were a premium thriller and just as committed to all the performances, everything committed. And Michael Lehman got, that was like, he was so interested in doing that and he did it so beautifully. Um, he loves that, those real thrillers. He's not poking fun at them in any way. And our, our, um, our cinematographer, John Limley, was also unbelievably talented. It's like, it looks so good. It's one more layer that makes you question whether you're watching a comedy or what you were watching. And, you know, for some people, that is just a delicious feeling to not know, to not know exactly what you're getting into. It's a, it's a rare feeling now with so much media. Um, and, and Michael Lehman was just, he, he loves bone dry comedy. So it's, it was great to have someone at the, the hand on the tiller was that, that dry it was terrific. And he was also, you know, the whole thing about, like you asked about the, the tone of the show, you know, that it was, it was, it was a constant it, we were finding the tone kind of the whole way. I remember when we wrote that initial outline, um, you know, we had the the thing about um, her daughter dying, Anna's daughter dying um, at Take Your Daughter to Work Day, um, when her husband, who was a forensic psychiatrist for the FBI specializing in serial killers, <laughs> left her daughter alone with this guy, Massacre Mike. And, and on the page, you know, that read, that read funny, and that was actually... <laughs> I remember one of the reasons that was one of the things that attracted Kristen to the show. And then Michael Lehman, when he, he was like, yeah, it reads funny, but how are we going to execute this? <laughs> you know, while keeping everyone likable, you can't not like the husband, you can't, you know, Douglas, you can't not like Anna. And it was just, we, I think we did do a good job of just kind of threading that needle of, having it be absurd, having it be funny. And I think people come across as, as likable. And kind of off the, the back of that and jumping back to what Rachel was saying earlier, for you, Jessica and Brittany, what was that kind of precipice of how you initially saw the tone and the way that you kind of saw that if you played things in a straight manner, that it had a certain effect and, and that it could play very differently to then leaning into the parody aspect of it? Yeah, I think it's what, what Larry said earlier, where we figured if we went for the parody right away, it would get kind of old. You know, you have eight episodes of hitting sort of the same thing. And what we ended up doing was sort of um, building up to that. And then there's obviously a crescendo in the finale where everything is so absurd and it really comes together. Um, so that was that was kind of always more interesting to us was to play it straight. And also it helps, I think, make the show even more broad appealing because there are going to be some people who just watch it for the mystery because the mystery works on its own. Um, and there are going to be some people who watch it because it's it's hilarious. And then hopefully a lot of people will be in the middle of that Venn diagram too. Um, but when I first read the outline, I, I said to Jessica, this is kind of like a deadly adoption, which she did with Will and, and Kristen at Lifetime. And I, I loved that movie because it was... I mean, not a joke in sight. It was played so straight, but it was so funny because it both celebrated and poked fun at those very earnest melodramatic movies. So it was nice to be able to do some of that here, but also hit the comedy um, even harder as the season got a little bit further down the road. And when it when it comes to a lot of the details, like, you know, if you take Massacre Mike and, and the fact that 
the details of it kind of are very funny on paper. And when you say out loud, like, oh, yeah, you know, an eight year old kid was left alone with a cannibal who wanted to eat her, you know, that's objectively quite funny and, and also fairly absurd. And and you have the performances playing it very straight. But when you were conceptualizing the episodes and a lot of the details like that, were there kind of any conversations that you had along the way with certain details or certain narrative arcs or character details where you were trying to figure out how far can we push the absurdist element? Like how far can we take, you know, the slightly comedic ridiculous elements that work really well on the show before it kind of goes a little too far and falls off a cliff? Maybe it was more about when to do those things than how far. Because I think it, ultimately we went very, 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 very far. So that we were, there wasn't a ceiling, but but we did have to we did have a lot of discussion about when to go far, and and so it's in this I don't even remember now the second episode is when we learn about Masker Mike, and we you just have to feel it out I think and decide when you want to do something that would make maybe someone with no sense of humor be like a gas, and someone with a sense of humor to to laugh at. And I think the casting of, of Brendan Jennings as Massacre Mike <laughs> helped a lot too. <laughs> um kind of because the, the mystery itself, as Larry was saying, like has to work, you know, you have to be able to be invested in that to, to kind of stay connected to the story throughout several episodes. Um, was it a case of kind of figuring out ultimately, well, where is the, where is the arc going to end? And then kind of like building back to fill in some of the details or, or what was kind of the way that you really wanted to shape the narrative arc with the fact that with a mystery, so much is writing on that final episode and, and how you find closure for the audience. I mean, I think we, I think that was early on, we knew that we wanted to, I could say spoilers, right? Is yeah, that, we can say spoilers. You know, I think early on we wanted, we wanted it to, um, you know, uh, one of the shows we wrote on before this was Mike Tyson Mysteries. So we, you know, every episode's got a mystery in it and, and we kind of prided ourselves in having- And every like, episode had Mike Tyson in it too. That's right. <laughs> and it was just like, a, we, it, was a, it was a shocking uh, ending and, um, you know, in basically every episode. So we wanted to do the same thing here. And um, so we knew we wanted who we wanted to be the murderer. And we knew we wanted, you know, Anna to have a, a big, you know, savage fight with an eight year old girl uh, at the end. Um, so we always knew we wanted that to be sort of the end of this thing. Like that's kind of where we, that's the absurdity we were going for. And because you're bringing up that that scene in the final episode, definitely getting very spoilery with this this question. Um, you know, the fight with an eight year old child is is partly hilarious because it's so shocking to see a grown woman going in that hard. And it's not something where you where that scene plays for like just a minute and it's a brief tussle. You know, it's a real kind of like balls to the wall knockout fight between these two women. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask about kind of the the genesis and the journey of that scene coming together and figuring out how far you could take kind of the, the violence of what's happening between the two of them, because at the end of the day, it is also an audience watching an eight-year-old girl be beaten up, but at the same time, you're on Anna's side the whole time. I think once you see the mastermind that was Emma and you see how uh, evil she is, you You really are rooting for Kristen to, to beat the hell out of her. <laughs> and um, we had always been referenced, what was the movie you referenced in, in the script that you were like, a, a fight? Oh, well, the fight uh -huh. was like, there was a some Steven Soderbergh movie with Gina Carano. I don't remember. And it was, you but know. But it was just very brutal and real and not like, it's not like they each grabbed like a TV and hit it on the head and then someone else okay. grabs like a flame. It was like, instead of that kind of stuff, we just went for like a hard, like a bar fight. real <laughs> fight. And, um, and that seems funnier with a child. Than <laughs> and, you know, there was talk of, does she actually kill her in the end? That <laughs> seems harsh, but I think it would have been so disappointing if we, if we hadn't followed out. through and, but, of course, hopefully finding, integrating some humor into the weapon that was used to finally kill Emma softens it just enough, but um, it, you had to either go for it or not. And thank God we had so many 
really gutsy, trusting people working on this project from the top down. And um, we think it's really successful, that scene. I, and I, I remember that the day, like shooting the show, because it's so straight and it's so committed. It's not like those comedies where everyone's laughing so hard with every take. There's not, it's all serious, you know? And then it, the end, I had a little feeling of like, is this really that gonna be that funny? And the day we, they brought us over to watch the rehearsal of Kristen Bell and Samsara, just the rehearsal after they'd worked with the stunt people. I thought it was the funniest thing. Just watching the rehearsal looked funny. And it was so gratifying because it felt like this is gonna work. The ending is gonna be funny. Watching these, those two just pretend to fight was great. Yeah, our stunt <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Larry. Oh, well, I was just going to say, like she was saying, um, it's when you go far, you know, when do you kind of push it and you pick your spots, but then when you do, you have to commit and, and go for it. You can't kind of go halfway to make them work. And Br Brittany, did you want to add anything to that as well? Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say our stunt coordinators were geniuses. We had Shauna. Oh, God, why am I forgetting her last name? Shauna from Glow. She's a genius. And I think they were really smart because if you analyze the fight, which we've we've seen it way too many times, <laughs> and the, Emma's more violent than Anna. And Kristen's head gets put through a window. And so, like, you sort of earn Anna then um, you know, responding in the way she does. And I think Kristen too, like she is such a winning actress and you'd be crazy not to root for her. So I think the fight works even more because we have her um, and a different actress. It might not have been as easy to watch or as funny to watch. <laughs> yeah. It's a real testament to an actress's like ability. If you can watch her kill If, you, if she could <laughs> shit out of this, an eight year old, yeah. <laughs> that's the, 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 the standard. than Samsara. Yeah, it made it more of an even fight for both. They're both we. <laughs> I mean, in the way that you all talk about all of these choices and all these decisions and even, you know, the construction of a scene like that, because if that had come earlier in the show, something that extreme, it wouldn't have worked. It, it feels like you were so conscious of the audience experience at every single step of the way. And sometimes that's about how you're bringing them into the story at the beginning, how you're kind of giving them payoff towards the end. Sometimes it's, it's you know, it's the little like, where are we gonna take them? What are the breadcrumbs that are gonna lead them potentially down the wrong path before we bring them back to, to the final conclusion? Um, and so just wanted to hear a little bit more about how the audience and, and the way that you all thought so consciously about that was such a part of the process of creating this story and figuring out how to tell it as well. I mean, I the way we write we, we have to really love what we're writing. Um, and so the audience we were writing for kept being ourselves. And it was, um, we love the end product of this show. And that's really all, all we could do as the creators. Um, and, and thank goodness having this, the immense support and the, the collaboration of Netflix and Gloria Sanchez you know, kept it, I'm sure, from at times going off the rails because we we really just wanted something that was gonna make us laugh. And and I I really wouldn't tune into something for eight episodes if I didn't need to know how it ended. And at each at each pass, during each edit, um, as long as we were all satisfied, I just felt really confident in the product and, and I, I hope other people do as well. I just know how much I love how it ended up. Same. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, I mean, with, with the work encompassed by the five of you throughout the show, it really does span every single stage of, you know, initial conception, development, all of the details of, of production coming together, um, everything that you finessed in post and, and how you wanted to share this with audiences. And so I was interested in just kind of hearing from each of you about what, what was the most challenging aspect or, or step or, of this journey and the show getting made for you. Um, and Jessica, I'm going to start with you. Um, COVID? <laughs> <laughs> no, we were in the height. Like it was, you know, the cast was in little cages. It was, it was dark, but, um, and really difficult. And it's hard to be, 
you know, I think the hardest part about being on a set and specifically a comedy set, even though it wasn't like a laugh riot every day and not being able to have those moments after takes of like laughter and camaraderie. It was, I think that was the hardest thing. And we missed that a lot. Yeah. And Brittany. Yeah. I, I think definitely COVID was a huge challenge. I think, you know, aside from that, we cross bordered all episodes. And so like figuring out, you know, you had mentioned the things in each shot, like Michael and, and John Lindley and our AD were so thoughtful about that. And I think that added extra difficulty with the COVID considerations of like, how are we going to shoot interiors and how many people can we have in the interior? So, you know, it just, it just adds to that. But I must say like, we shot shoots two shows simultaneously in COVID and it was, you know, it was ridiculous. Um, but this show was such a joy because everyone involved loved what we were doing and is a wonderful person. Like Rachel, Larry, and Hugh are just dream humans. And Kristen is a dream human and Michael Lehman. And like, it was in a really challenging time, such a bright light for us. Um, so I think that comes through in the product. I think you can see that everyone's kind of having a good time and really believing what they're, what they're doing in. And like, I would do it a million times over again. It was such a joy. Yeah. Larry. I, I agree. And I, I, you know, to, to what you're saying, you know, there were in the filming, there were zones, right? So there was performance. And that was the director and the actors. And we as showrunners weren't allowed in that zone. And so what's necessary there is massive trust and massive communication going into it. And um, we had that. And so, it, it, you know, I'm a control freak. So there were moments that were very scary where it was like, you know, you wanted to get something across and, and you just hoped and prayed that it would work. But like you were saying, Brittany, everybody was on the same page. They got it. You play it real. You play it straight. You trust in the material. And um, and then the only other challenge was, you know, craft service was all like, you know, you couldn't just go grab what you wanted. And so like, you couldn't have a coffee on set. So, you know, the fun stuff wasn't there, but... I, it, it worked in the end, thank goodness. But maybe better because you can't just like sneak seven donuts. You have to, to ask, ask them. for M and M's yeah. again. Yeah, mm -hmm. you don't do it. Yeah, I know because Rachel was talking about these zones. I know you know it was tough because you know everyone was so spread out. You know, I remember like you know normally you'd you'd give a note you know to the director or something, and you'd all be kind of right next to each other, and you just it's not a big deal. But then everyone's so spread out. I remember having to run in with a note and then Kristen had done it like, you know, 10 times. And it's like, well, everyone sees one of us running in and, you know, it's just so like, oh, you just can't help but think, oh shit, everybody, everybody hates me right now. Cause it's such a public, oh, one of the showrunners is giving a note as opposed to just a normal time. It could just be discreet about it. I think the thing it was like the most, um, ultimately incredibly rewarding things that also seemed like it was going to be the biggest challenge and was, was I don't know many things that the tone shifts over the course of the project, like the, the story. And maybe, I don't know what Russian absurdist literature maybe does that. I don't know. Like, uh, but we, the fact that we all stayed on the same page, Michael Lane, Jessica and Brittany, Netflix. We were all staying on the same page on something that the page kept slightly altering is remarkable because it just like at every step of this, it was like gradually turning up the heat on a pot of water so that you didn't realize when you were gonna bo boil the water. I don't know, it was something, it was in incredibly difficult and we all had each other and that we all stayed liking each other and supporting each other is remarkable because it just seemed like it would have been an easy thing to, to become polarized over and lose your way. And we didn't. And we didn't get divorced. No. So far. <laughs>
Well, I love I love hearing all that, and and I think it it really does come come through what you're all saying about it's so clear that that everybody was having a great time in making this project. So congratulations on on the season, and thank you so much for sharing all of this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.